Welcome to part three of LBJ, The Great Society in Vietnam. Now we're going to talk about The Great Society. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson ran for the presidency in his own right. He'd always considered that year plus that he was serving as president after Kennedy died as Kennedy's term. And it was another political card he played to get what he wants. I'm just a placeholder. I'm just doing what Jack wanted. And then he was really doing what he, he wanted. All right. <clears throat> when he won in 1964 against Barry Goldwater, he won by one of the largest popular vote margins ever and the largest one in modern history. 61% of the American populace voted for LBJ. He won a landslide in the Electoral College, right? 90% of the Electoral College, right? Goldwater carried only five states. He carried the South because of the Civil Rights Act. Johnson had lost the South. And, of course, he carried his home state of Arizona, right? Um, Vermont, for example, voted for a Democratic candidate for the uh, first time since the Republican Party came into being and did so by a margin of almost two to one, right? On top of that, Democrats also increased their membership in the Senate. They went from 66 to 68 members, having a vast majority, and also had a majority in the House with 295 members of the House. So Johnson's now in a position to begin building his own legacy, or at least what he hopes his legacy to be. And he bases it all on a continuation of the New Deal, a new New Deal. He calls it uh, the Great Society, right? He's setting the groundwork for this in the State of the Union address given the year prior to the election or the months prior to the election, right? He says, this administration today, here and now, declares an unconditional war on poverty in America. Our chief's weapons and a more pinpointed attack will be better schools and better health and better homes and better training and better job opportunities to help more Americans, especially young Americans, escape from the squalor and misery and unemployment roles where citizens help, help to carry them, right? He's setting the groundworks. He's declaring a war on poverty, right? That's what his legacy is gonna be built on. And like I said, he declares this war in January of 1964 before the presidential election, and then he's going to follow up by giving it a name. In May of 1964, at the University of Michigan, he's going to name this war on poverty. He's going to say, we're going to assemble the best thoughts and broadest knowledge for all, from all over the world to find these answers. I intend to establish working groups to prepare a series of conferences and meetings on the cities, on natural beauty, on the quality of education, and on other emerging challenges. And from these studies, we will begin to set our course towards the Great Society. Like I said, University of Michigan on May 22nd, 1964. All right. Now, remember, Johnson is a New Deal style Democrat. He, during the, uh, during the Roosevelt administration, he was the first administrator, administrator of the National Youth Administration, the NYA, a New Deal program in the state of Texas, right? And so the Great Society is his vision of the New Deal being applied in a modern perspective in order to fight his war on poverty. So in 1965, with him securing his, his own administration by winning the election of 1964 and having majorities in both the House and the Senate, Johnson's now ready to push his great society forward. And he starts getting bills passed in order to promote it, like the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. This is a $1 billion program that gives federal aid to schools. It helps them purchase materials, helps them start special education programs, and of course it has since expanded since then. Uh, the Higher Education Act of 1965 will uh, be geared more towards the universities, right? It gives federal money to the universities in order to create scholarship programs, low interest loans, you know, things like, you know, some of you may be familiar with Sally Mae, right? You get your loans. I've always said that the best way to find a missing person is not to put them on a milk carton, but take a student loan out in their name and then don't make the payments because Sally Mae will find you, right? Um, the Medicare, Medical Care Act of 1965, this is the, uh, this authorized a program called Medicare, which is going to cover hospital and nursing costs, as well as uh, another plan that's going to cover uh, medical expenses for people. This is the first attempt at creating a national uh, medical uh, care system in the United States, right? 
and the Model Cities Act of 1966. This is an interesting program. It provided for $1.2 billion for the improvement of housing, recreation areas, health and education systems in economically depressed areas of urban uh, areas of cities. The slums, right? The bill, though, was structured to make sure that the money infused into these uh, depressed areas of cities stayed in those cities. For example, if you're revitalizing a series of slums, like maybe tearing uh, down the houses, rebuilding new complexes, new uh, apartment complexes, or what have you, the contractors must be locally contracted. The employees must, or the, uh, the workers must be local employees. So not only is the money being used to revitalize that community, that money is also be, being used to create jobs inside of that community under the belief that they help the entire community become uh, entirely revitalized. This is the kind of legacy that Johnson really wishes that he leaves behind, the great society. This is what he wants to be remembered for. Now, unfortunately for him, he's going to be remembered for something else, Vietnam.